In this video, we're going to talk about internal flow. We've talked about external flow, which is different uh, in that there's a free surface. So the boundary layer thickness growth is not restricted by a physical barrier. Of course, that's not the case for internal flow. In internal flow, the fluid is confined by the inner surface of the pipe, and that'll affect our velocity boundary layer development as well as our thermal boundary layer development. Let's start by just thinking about the hydrodynamic considerations before we start thinking about heat transfer. Let's look at flow in a circular pipe in which flow is going from the left to the right. On the left, we see that the fluid is entering the tube at some uniform velocity u. And as soon as the fluid enters the tube, it makes contact with the wall of the pipe. And you can see how that changes the velocity profile. The velocity right at the surface of the pipe at R0 is zero due to the no slip condition. And as we move towards the center of the pipe, um, you, can, you can see that the velocity increases to a maximum. The areas in dark gray represent the boundary layer in which the velocity is changing with respect to R. You can see in the light gray area closer to the center, the velocity is not changing, which means that the boundary layer thickness hasn't grown to encompass the flow towards the center yet. This is called the inviscid region since the viscous effects are not felt in that region. As we move to the right, however, you can see that the inviscid region shrinks as the boundary layer, which is developing around the circumference of the tube, begins to extend towards the center, eventually meeting in the center. The entire length of the tube where this is happening is called the hydrodynamic entrance region. The length of the pipe that it takes to get there is the hydrodynamic entrance length. Anywhere past that hydrodynamic entrance length, the velocity profile does not change with respect to x. It'll be the same here as it is 50 meters down the pipe. We call this fully developed flow. Of course, it still changes with, re with respect to r, if where it'll be zero at r naught. It'll reach a maximum at the center, but the velocity profile shape will not change. So if the flow is fully developed, the velocity profile does not change with respect to x. Another important thing to remember is that the pressure gradient is constant in the fully developed region. In other words, for a given distance, the pressure will drop a certain amount, and that relationship is constant for the entire length of pipe past the entering region. The length that it takes for flow to get fully developed after it enters the pipe depends on whether or not the flow is laminar or turbulent. Just like in external convection, we need to calculate the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number is calculated based upon some characteristic length, which for flow over a flat plate is the length, and here in internal flow through a pipe is the diameter d. Also note that instead of u infinity, the free stream velocity over a flat plate, we have the mean velocity. The critical Reynolds number for pipe flow is 2300. So here we're looking at a clear fluid flowing through a tube and we've injected some dye. And when the flow is laminar, those fluid molecules are flowing along the same streamline. But if the, flu if the uh, Reynolds number goes above 2300, we start to see the onset of turbulence. At first, we just see a little wiggle in the flow of the dye and the flow isn't fully turbulent yet. But if the Reynolds number is increased more and more, we start to see more and more evidence of turbulence. And once we reach a Reynolds number of around 10,000, the flow will be fully turbulent. So you can see that that transition to full turbulence occurs over a span of Reynolds numbers. But for our class, we'll take any Reynolds number over 2300 to indicate turbulent flow. Let's look at the hydrodynamic entry length for laminar, for, uh, laminar flow. You can see that the hydrodynamic entrance length is indicated here where the inviscid region has disappeared. After that entrance region, there's no change in the velocity profile with respect to x. If the Reynolds number is less than 2300, the hydrodynamic entrance length is approximately 1 20th of the Reynolds number times the diameter. If the flow is turbulent, note that the entrance region is shorter, and also note that the velocity profile, while still parabolic shaped, is a little more blunter with turbulent flow. For the purposes of our class, we'll consider uh, that the flow has become fully developed at 10 diameters. However, keep in mind, as we saw, we don't really reach full turbulence until a Reynolds number close to 10,000. So if, if your Reynolds number is closer to 2300 rather than 10,000, you may have not fully reached, um, you may have not reached full, uh, fully developed conditions um, until a length of maybe 60 diameters. Um, but as I said, for this class, if the Reynolds number is over 2300, you can assume turbulent conditions such that fully developed flow develops a, at a location 10 diameters from the entrance of the pipe. It's just something to be aware of. 
All right, so now let's talk about velocity. We often don't really care about how velocity varies across the cross-sectional area, and it's much more convenient to refer to the average or the mean velocity um, flowing through our pipe. In order to define the mean velocity, we need to define the mass flow rate. You'll recall that the mass flow rate is density times velocity times the cross-sectional area through the which the mass is flowing. We'll define this more generally for a differential area. We note that the velocity is a function of radial position and location x from the pipe entrance, although if it's fully developed, the flow is independent uh, of x and dependent on radial direction only. Now we relate uh, the definition for the mass flow, uh, mass flow rate back to the mean velocity. The density is constant, uh, so it comes out of the integral and divides out. Then we define that differential cross-sectional area. Don't get confused about why we defined the differential cross-sectional area as 2 pi dr. Uh, that cross-sectional area could be defined as the integral of the derivative of a, integrated from r to r naught. I know that I can, um, I can, I know the cross-sectional area of, of the air, the, or the cross-sectional area is just pi r naught squared. And I can multiply that by 2 over 2 without changing anything. And then just working backwards, uh, I could see that the integral of 2 pi r dr integrated from 0 to r naught will get me the cross-sectional area. Canceling out a few terms and only looking at the fully developed region, we have an expression for the average or the mean velocity. You can get an expression for the velocity profile as a function of r for fully developed laminar incompressible flow in a circular tube by applying the conservation of, mo of momentum. Now we'll skip the derivation here, but do note that if we take the maximum velocity to be at r equals zero, we can see that the maximum velocity for fully developed laminar pipe flow is twice that of the average velocity. If you look at how the mean velocity is defined, you see this term dp over dx. This is the pressure drop over a differential length in pipe. Pressure drops are absolutely something that would be of interest to us and that because that pressure drop is directly related to the power requirements of a fan or a pump required to maintain flow. Um, also remember that if the flow is fully developed, dp over dx is equal to a constant. In practice, it's convenient to express the pressure loss for all types of fully developed internal flow in terms of the Moody friction factor f. If the flow is fully developed, the pressure gradient dp dx is a constant, and the expression becomes even clear uh, or even simpler. Um, so you may also see this referred to as the Darcy friction factor. Sometimes you see it referred to as the Darcy Weisbach friction factor over the two engineers who provided the most contribution to the development of this equation. Um, the equation that you see here is valid for all fully developed internal flows, regardless of whether you have a circular pipe, a non-circular pipe or duct, whether the pipe's interior surface is smooth or rough, or if the pipe is inclined or horizontal. If a non-circular pipe is used, the diameter D is replaced with the hydraulic diameter, which is defined as 4 times the cross-sectional area divided by the perimeter, not pressure. The Moody chart is really convenient because we can get the fric friction factor and then plug it into this equation to get the pressure drop. So let's look at what we have here. On the left hand side we have the friction factor. Note that that scale is not linear, it's logarithmic. On the x-axis we have the Reynolds number. For laminar flow we could see that the friction factor is only a function of the Reynolds number. So you could just directly calculate the friction factor by dividing 64 by the Reynolds number. And the properties used for that Reynolds should be evaluated at the average of the surface and mean temperature. If the flow is turbulent, the relationship gets a little more tricky. The friction factor will be a function, uh, uh, will be a function of the Reynolds number as well as the surface roughness. Um, so that relative roughness is the roughness divided by the diameter. And you can see some repre representative values for the roughness for several materials lifted, listed at the bottom of the chart. All right, so next time we'll talk about some thermal considerations for internal flow. I hope that was helpful. Thank you for watching.